service and especially those that are joining us online as well thank you for being with us and we can have a powerful time of ministry and worship and the word by jeff hall and so let us celebrate jesus amen lord we just want to thank you that we can come as your people and those that are watching us online those that are here right here in the sanctuary we want to celebrate jesus we want to worship you in spirit and in truth and give you praise and glory and honor as we worship you in Jesus' name. And all God's people would say, Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord together. Amen. Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Amen. Amen. So let's get up on our feet and praise His name. Hallelujah.
this one moment just one touch from you put aside all distractions cause I came for you and I came for you I need you for you. 
upon this church. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven to pour your spirit out. Yes, Lord. Pour your spirit out. Oh, holy anointing, the power of just sense that God wants to do that. God wants to just pour out His Spirit upon each one of us. I want you to begin to sense that God is doing a fresh new thing in our lives. God is wanting a new season to come forth in our lives. If you are here today and you came to church and you're saying, you know, I'm not sure what the future holds for me, but I'm ready for new seasons. I'm ready for the new things in my life. I'm ready to posture myself for what God you have for me. And, and the amazing thing is, when we think of pouring out God's Spirit, I think of the verse that is found in Joel 2.28. Now, the first part of the prophecies that the prophet Joel gave in the Old Testament were all negative things. 
It was about judgment on Israel. It's about the sin of the people. It was about everything you can think about that is negative, that the people were worshipping idols and everything else. It was like, you know, first chapter 1 is like judgment. And the early part of chapter 2 was like judgment. And anything that's, that's so-called negative. It's like what we're doing and experiencing today in the world yeah, with the pandemic and, you know, people, you know, having to... To, to make adjustments and, and make changes. And, and then Joel 2.28 is the first positive thing that comes into what Prophet Joel says to the nation of Israel. And this is what the Prophet Joel says. And I will pour out my spirit on all people. I will pour out my spirit on all people. After hearing all the judgments and negative things about sin and idolatry and and then the good news, Joe said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And then he further adds on, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. Now categorize yourself. Whether you are sons, daughters, young men, old men, young people, old people. It doesn't matter what. It is talking about new things. He's talking about prophesying. He's talking about seeing vision. He's talking about dreaming dreams. You know, when you dream a dream, it is not just when you're sleeping and then you have this nightmare or dream. No. When you dream a dream, it's about dreaming a dream that, God, you are going to use me to impact nations. It's like dreaming a dream that says, God, you're going to use me to be an influence in the marketplace. It's like dreaming a dream that says, Lord, you know, I, I'm going to, to walk as your servant that you will, you will set that seal upon my heart, upon my life. It doesn't matter. Prophecy, dreaming, dreams, seeing visions, these are new things. These are things that God will begin to let you grow in your heart, in your life. Will you lift up your hand and say, Lord, I'm ready for the new season. I'm ready for new things in my life. I, I'm, I'm wanting to step out to, to prophesy, to, to say things I've never said before because you are revealing things to me. I'm willing to dream dreams because, Lord, there are things that, that I, I've been looking at in my life and, and I've been sheltered in. But, God, you're wanting me to step out into new arenas. Lord, I will see visions because, Lord, these are things I don't naturally see. But, Lord, you begin to captivate my heart and my life and you will bring me closer to it and encounter with you. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Hallelujah. And that's what we're going to do right now. Asking the Holy Spirit to pour the Spirit of God into our hearts, into our lives. Lord, we wouldn't worship you. We are you going know, to magnify your name. Oh, pour your spirit, oh God. Pour your spirit. Oh, sing it along with me. Our lives bring about the revolution that is needed. 
Bring about the change that is needed. Bring about that encounter that is needed. Bring about a realization that we need to go beyond just hearing, but listening and obeying and walking in step with the Spirit. Bring about in our hearts, in our lives, a deeper revelation of God. Lord, help us to, to encounter you. Help us to be drawn closer to you. Help us, Lord, that we can prophesy. Help us, Lord, that we can dream dreams. Help us, Lord, that we can see visions. Lord, for every one of us that is here, Lord, there's nothing, nothing too difficult for you. There will be the supernatural encounters. There will be the revelation of God. And there will be things, Lord, that you will set into our path as miracles and signs and wonders. And Lord, you are not going to withhold those blessings. You are going to pour forth those blessings into every one of us. And we give you praise. We give you glory. And all God's people would say, Amen. 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 Turn to your neighbor and tell them, all right? Tell them, expect a miracle. Come on, just tell them then. Expect a miracle. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. That was wonderful worship. Really, you know, sense the presence of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you so much. And hallelujah. God is good. God is good. All right. I think it's great if you can have one of the house lights on, right, the, the rear one will be fine. Now, we have a, a first-time visitor by the name of Jenny Yao. Jenny, where are you? Can you please wave your hand? All right, over there. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for coming and uh, joining us. And wonderful being here. Please stay back for a cup of coffee. And uh, I'm sure there will be people that are lovely wanting to meet you and get to know you as well. Amen. Thank you. All right, and it's good to see new people here. We have uh, returning visitors here. I, I can see Mandy right at the back. Mandy, thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, Clayton is here. Wonderful. All right, thank you. Um, we want to worship the Lord through our giving, all right? You know, offering and our tithes and offering. We had our AGM a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, God has supplied more than what we need uh, through our finances in the church. And that is because the posture of generosity, the posture of giving, is, is really part of the DNA of our church. And uh, I just want to encourage you to step forth, to be faithful in sowing into the kingdom. Next week, I'm going to talk about sowing and reaping. And what an amazing thing that, that, that Paul says in the book of Galatians chapter 6 uh, is really about financial giving. And I want to talk about that next week, all right, because... So don't, don't miss church because I think this is really the essence. My title of my sermon next week is Church Together. Church Together. And you begin to see Paul moves away from chapter 5 into chapter 6 into something new, into something fresh. All right? So I want to share that with you next week. But let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless our giving today. Lord, we just want to thank you that as we give unto you. Lord, it is such a joy, such a privilege to participate together. Thank you for the generosity of our people, for the DNA that is in us to be generous, to be liberal in our giving. And so, Lord, we pour forth and we sow into the kingdom and we know we shall reap as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you as you give. Um, right after the service, where is Pastor Thomas? I'm sure he's out here somewhere. Oh, right back in the corner. All right. Uh, please see Pastor Thomas because we're going to have a busy bee uh, it is important for us to spruce up the church, especially we're getting ready for our Christmas event coming up. So if you can just spare even 30 minutes, all right, of your time, um, you know, just go out to Pastor Thomas and say, let, let me know how we can help. Uh, just take care of some of the, and just neaten up the, the place uh, in our church. So please see Pastor Thomas afterwards. You know, this coming Wednesday is our final prayer meeting for the year. And this Wednesday from 7 to 8.30, I want to just ask the whole church to come together. We have a special guest speaker by the name of Nigel uh, Bernard that will be preaching and ministering. You know, I met him a few weeks ago and I just sense that this guy has such a heart for revival. And he's going to talk about the R in the first letter of the word revival. And I want to encourage you to take time this Wednesday to come and let's just, let's just press in to what God has for us. I believe it's going to be a prophetic word uh, that will be released this Wednesday as we come to pray. And uh, we're just going to believe God for the breakthroughs, all right? So uh, I want to encourage you to come and join us and be a part of the type of ministry uh, that will be taking place this Wednesday. 
And then Christmas. All right, Christmas, we have a couple of activities. There's a bit of echo uh, in, the, in the monitor speakers, so if you all can take care of that. Um, Christmas, we have two things happening. One is the Arabian Christmas night, or a day service, all right, at 10 o'clock, and then followed by lunch, which is a Christmas night. If you can help with our Christmas lunch, please see uh, Andrea. Uh, because we need lots of food. We are hoping to cater to at least 180 people uh, for the Christmas lunch. And then uh, we have a Christmas Day service. There will be a Christmas Day service, uh, and that will be on the 25th December. No service on a Sunday, the 26th. Uh, spend some time with your mates and get together. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to come together. We have a one-hour Christmas Day service. I know some of you have Christmas lunch, your family and different ones. Uh, but we are just going to have a one hour service from 10 to 11 And then you can go for your lunch thereafter Alright, praise God Angel Tree There's going to be uh, our Angel Tree project again this year uh, This is a ministry to people, families that are, uh, have loved ones that are uh, incarcerated in prison uh, And so here is an opportunity for us uh, we, we want to be able to uh, buy Christmas gifts, wrap them up, and actually hand deliver these gifts to the children uh, that is in that is uh, in these homes around our area in Belmont. Uh, so if you can help out, uh, please see label uh, right after the service. We're gonna have a baby dedication. My my granddaughter is gonna be dedicated. Come on up, whole family, pastors and elders, come and join us as well uh, on the stage. And so we are gonna have. Uh, the, the baby dedication, okay? Uh, and Angelina is going to help us uh, with this time uh, together. So, elders and uh, pastors, come and join uh, right here. Okay. So, I got three grandkids, two daughters, two granddaughters here, and then one, um, uh, one grandson in Singapore. Look, everybody's here? Wow, that's good. Well, it's a privilege And the scripture says that children are a gift from God He gives you arrows to put in your quiver And so even as we dedicate baby Alessia We have to ask you, Mark and Dorothy That you will submit to God And that you will obey Him and do whatever in your capacity With the help of the Holy Spirit To lead, guide and teach Alessia in the ways of God So that when she grows up, she won't depart from it so will you affirm and commit yourself to doing that? Yes. 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 We all heard the yes, right? <laughs> but we know that it takes a whole village to raise up a child. So even as we, the extended family in the church, that we will also make that same commitment to help them grow Alessia up in the ways of God. Okay, so if... And Eleanor, Eleanor, will you say yes to helping raise your, your little sister? Yeah? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Father, we just want to thank you for this beautiful gift that you've given to Mark and Dorothy and Eleanor and also to the rest of our family. We thank you that you are such a gracious God. And from the beginning, even before the beginning, the foundations of the world, you have already chosen Alessia. And you have a plan and a purpose for her. And your word says that it is a plan to prosper, a plan with a hope and a future. So we claim that plan and speak it into her life, that through the years, Lord, you will protect her, keep her from harm, build your hedge of protection around her, nurture the spirit man within her. So that at a very young age, she will recognize and know what it means to walk in the ways of God. That she will give her life to Jesus, her Savior, her friend, her Lord. And she will know who her loving Heavenly Father is. And that she will respond to Holy Spirit as you would lead and guide and comfort her. I pray for your hand to be upon Mark and Dorothy as parents. That you will give them wisdom. 
you give them patience, you give them uh, the fruit of the Spirit to be nurtured in their life, that even as they would guide Alessia, not only Alessia, but also Eleanor, that they will truly lead them in the ways of God so that when Alessia grows up, she will not depart from it. And she will be the woman of faith that you have destined her to be. And together with Eleanor, Lord, these two children will bring praise and glory to your name because they, you have given them that heritage of being brought up in a Christian home. We pray, Lord, for ourselves as well, as the extended family, that we will also stand firm together with the parents in partnership with them, with you, as we see Alessia grow, as we give her godly advice, as we commune with her, as we relate with her, that she will sense the presence of God in each one of our lives and respond positively to you as well. So we commit ourselves today and dedicate Alessia in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Praise God. While she was smiling all the way, praise God. Wonderful. Now, young parents, listen here. All right, we have lots of girls in our church. I need more boys. Can you have more boys now? All right, so those of you who are planning kids, pray for more boys, okay? All right, amen. And girls as well, all right? So uh, we can have as many as we can get, okay? Let's fill up the nursery room and then overtake the Sunday school room and then overtake this auditorium, all right? Okay, praise God. We, we have a special time uh, of ministry of the Word. Uh, together with Jeff Hall. Jeff, can you come on up here? Uh, Jeff is an uh, elder in our church and we don't welcome him uh, to the pulpit. Uh, you know, there's something about Jeff as um, we have gotten to know each other um, together, uh, visiting uh, each other's homes and d doing different things. Uh, you know, his heart is that of really wanting to serve people. Uh, the heart for pastoral care, the heart for ministry to people. You know, he is uh, involved with uh, uh, parachurch ministry, uh, which is really involved in touching the hearts and lives of people uh, in China, especially children. And, um, you know, it, it's just uh, wonderful to see such a heart of generosity, a heart that is caring for people as well. So I want you to open your hearts as we pray for Jeff as he ministers God's Word. And uh, surely we're going to welcome you and thank you for you and I to, to be part of our eldership team here in our church. And uh, I, I just believe that God is doing some great things through us. Amen. Lord, we just want to thank you for Jeff. Uh, thank you for his life and ministry. As he brings forth your word, let that be a settling in his heart as well as our hearts. That the Spirit of God is wanting to bring each one of us into a living encounter with him. And so we just want to thank you for your word that goes forth as a double-edged sword and bring about the, the work of your Holy Spirit in us as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Go for it. Go for it. Thank you, I will. Well, good morning from me too. Excuse me, I'll just move this little barrier over here a bit. And welcome to um, the seventh message in this series from the book of Galatians, I trust you've been as blessed as I have by the messages. I think there's two more after today, is there? Right. But we could have done with 20. I mean, every message has been jam-packed. Uh, last week, um, where Joe really spoke to us, I wanted to thank Joe. Is Joe here today? Oh, okay. I wanted to thank him. He really gave me some insight last week into a problem I've had for 52 years. It was 52 years ago, I stepped off the boat in Fremantle and became what they called in Australia a POM. And I never worked out what a POM was until last week. And Joe told us that a POM is performance orient orientated mentality. So I finally solved a problem. Thanks, Joe, if you're listening online. But, you know, Joe started on chapter 5 and told us about how these um, guys in Galatia, they'd been sort of muck around with the law a bit, and Paul had been saying, don't follow the Mosaic law and don't listen to anybody who tells you to do so. And he said that if you have a grace plus mentality, a grace plus Christianity doesn't work. If you say that grace plus anything doesn't work because grace is enough, grace is more than enough. And I worked out as I read the rest of chapter five this week that basically Paul's saying if you have a grace plus mentality, 
you'll end up with a life minus life. If you have grace plus, you end up with life minus. You end up with life minus freedom. And life minus freedom equals, who said marriage? Wrong. Life minus freedom equals slavery. And that's what Paul's on about in the rest of chapter 5 today. He's saying Jesus calls us on this walk to freedom. You're going to come and join us on it. So um, turn with me to chapter 5 of, oopsie, chapter 5 of Galatians. And we're just going to read, I'm going to read, and you're going to listen carefully (laughs) and soak it in. Sorry, I'm getting myself organised here. I am getting myself organised here. So we're reading today from verse 16 to verse 25. And I'll put my glasses on. So I say, says Paul, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry on your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And this is a key verse. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We're hearing a lot more recently about people who protest, not protestants, but protest, and they protest about freedom. You know the cry we hear on television, what do we want? Freedom. When do we want it? Now. And The protest is often aimed at lawmakers. It seems that people think that if you can throw out the law, you get freedom. If you can do what you like, you get freedom. Di and I experienced that in China. We lived in a country in Asia for a few years and um, had to try and work out how to navigate the traffic that is very different to here. It seems there are no laws, or if there are laws, nobody obeys them. I mean, the first time I stopped... I had a motor scooter thing, and um, first time I stopped at a a red traffic light, a policeman came and gave me a parking ticket. He'd never seen anybody do that before, stop at a red light. And I asked someone, what side of the road do I drive on? They said the one with least traffic and most potholes. No, yes, least traffic and least potholes. Weird. I mean, Di used to love it. She's a lawbreaker. She used to get on the back of my scooter, and I'd be going down the road, and she'd say, quick, Jeff, go faster, try and... Try and get through before the light goes green, you know, and we'd get through on the red light and she'd go, freedom! She would. And all the locals think crazy foreigners. But that was Paul's concern, right? Not that the camels and the chariots would disobey the rules, but his concern was that if the people in Galatia got the message that they didn't have to live by the law, then they would live without the law and be free to do what they like, what they like. They didn't understand that God's freedom that he gives us is not the freedom to do what we like, it's the freedom to do what he likes. And he really wanted to make that clear. And he says a few things about freedom, doesn't he? He says in verse, chapter 5, verse 1, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. 
There's no doubt about it. Christ has set us free for freedom, but it comes with a warning. Stand firm, therefore, and let your, do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Freedom is permanent. Apparently, when they use the noun and the verb in the same text, according to people who know this stuff, that means it's something that's complete. It's done. It's lasting. And that's what he did with freedom and free. But then he does a warning and says, but there's this thing called a yoke of slavery that could burden you. And he also goes on and says in 5.13, for you have been called to live in freedom, brothers and sisters. You've been called, like we talk about people being called to be pastors and people being called to be accountants and people being called to be parents and people being called. We've been called to freedom. It's like we've all been sitting in these jail cells and someone yells out our name and says, Young one, you are free. And you, and you stay in your jail. You don't walk out of it. You stay there, you know. <laughs> um, but Or you walk out of it and you keep coming back. And he says, no, we've been called to freedom. We've all been called to freedom. But he says, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. The calling and the gift comes with warnings. Don't lose it and become a slave. And don't abuse it by using it for your own pleasure. Actually, this walking of freedom is a bit like walking down a narrow ridge, a mountain ridge, right? It's a narrow ridge, you're walking down this ridge, and on one side there's a huge ditch, and on the other side there's another ditch. And if you lean to one side or the other, you fall in the ditch. And it's like... Paul is saying, you're walking down this road of freedom and one ditch you can fall in is a ditch of law. It's just going by doing what other people tell you to do, by doing what you think is right, by thinking you can add that add that to grace and it will get you into heaven. But when you lean back from that one, you might fall too far the other way and fall into this place of just doing what you like and living by sinful nature. And the invitation that Paul is saying today is, Walk this walk of freedom. And it's not one that you have to walk in fear that you're going to fall off, (laughs) but it's one that you walk following the Spirit of God. But what is freedom, first of all? Because we need to identify what the freedom is. What is this freedom that Jesus calls us to and allows us? What can we do in this freedom that we can't do out of this freedom? Says this, he says, we've been set free to worship. We've been set free to say no to sin. We've been set free to say yes to following Jesus. We've been set free to suffer for Jesus. That's a weird one, isn't it? But Paul does say in, in um, Philippians that we have been given the privilege of believing and the privilege of suffering. Today is the Independent World Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. There are millions of our brothers and sisters around the world today suffering for Jesus. And many of them feel free. They're in a prison cell, but they're free. Because God has freed them to suffer for Jesus. Always touched by those Moravian missionaries a couple of hundred years ago. They felt called to a little island called St. Thomas, which was in the Caribbean, the West Indies, and... It was, there was a lot of slaves there, real slaves, not pretend slaves, real slaves. These slaves, they, you know, they would die, they would be beaten up, they just had to do what they were told. And the only way to minister to these people was to leave Germany and sell themselves into slavery. They were free to sell themselves into slavery. And as, as they left, if they left the shore, probably never to come back. They yelled out, one of them yelled out to his family and his friends and his supporters that the Lamb of God might receive just reward for his suffering. That was it. They were free to do that. That's the freedom we have. We're set free to live out God's purpose for us and we're set free to converse with Father God. What What a freedom. You know, Psalm 27 says, My heart doth hear you say, in fact, I'll read it to you because I'll get it wrong otherwise. I love it. One of my favorite verses. Come, and my heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart does respond, I am coming. We're free. We're free to come talk with the Father. Not just to the Father, but with the Father, which means we get to listen to him too. And we hear him and he speaks to us and we speak to him. That's the freedom. That's the freedom that we have. 
But you wouldn't want to miss it, would you? But who is this Holy Spirit? Now, how comes he is qualified to be the one that leads us, that guides us, as it says in chapter 16, verse 16? Who is the Holy Spirit? It says this, When the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. We know the word Jesus uses there is that word parakletos, and it actually means legal counsellor, a comforter, one who comes alongside and who provides wise counsel. We don't have to get on our knees and beg him to come and be our guide, but we do need to let him do that. Galatians 5.16. Sorry, Galatians 5.16 has gone missing, but we'll find it. Galatians 5.16. Sorry, slide person, we've got to go backwards. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. You know the biggest word, the biggest word in that sentence? It's that little word, let, L-E-T. It's a huge word, and it's a key. It's a key to knowing the freedom in Jesus. It's let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let him guide you. Let him direct you. Let him be the one that you check in with for everything. But, you know, the issue is that sometimes for us, letting is not easy. You know what it's like when you're trying to do something and someone comes along and says, Oh, let him do that. He can do it better. Don't we hate that? (laughs) We want to do it. We want to finish the job. We think we're good enough. And if we're going to let the Holy Spirit guide our lives, we have to be prepared to say, there's someone who can do this better than me. It's the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the counsellor, the comforter, the one who comes alongside and walks with us. But sometimes to let the Holy Spirit do that means we've got to let go of something else. We're holding on to things that are precious to us. And while we're holding on to those things, we can't really let the Holy Spirit hold on to us. We're holding on to ambitions. We're all holding on to goals. We're all holding on to things that are precious for us. And we don't want to let go of those because if we let go of those and let the Holy Spirit lead us, he might take us to places where we can't achieve the things that are important to us. And we don't want to let go of stuff. And it can be good stuff, but it's holding us back. And letting go could mean we need to move aside. And sometimes we just think we're just so important and so clever. We're good problem solvers. We've, we've got an issue, we're leading our family, and I can work that out because I'm really smart. And sometimes God says, you've got to step aside. You've got to move aside. The Holy Spirit can take that place of the most important person in your life, the most important person in your family, the most important person in your church, We've got to move aside and put, away, put down these things that we are proud of. We have pride in them. And to let may mean to make room. You know, we invite Holy Spirit into our life and we say, make yourself at home. Do we really mean it? If you invite him into your house, you might say to me, come, come stay with us for a while. Make yourself at home, Jeff. And I'd go, fine, thank you. And I'd take the curtains down and change them, get some furniture, move it out, change everything. You go, that's not what I mean by let make yourself at home. But when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us, we have to say, make yourself at home. And he'll take the furniture and furniture that's in the way and cluttering up your life and move it out. And you thought it was so important. And he'll change the priorities and he'll change the pictures on the wall and he'll make himself at home. There was a time when Diane and I, I mean, we've just had this wonderful life being led by the Holy Spirit, not because we've done anything right, just because he's done everything right. And it started one day back in August, back in August, back in 20, it was probably 19 something, actually, probably 1985. And we went forward at a service, it was a service, a missionary service, and Diane and I both on that day felt that God was saying to us, come forward and and to commit to going where I ask you to go, doing what I ask you to do, being what I want you to be. And we committed our life to whatever God wanted us. We had a young family and a house and a business. We were going well. And we just said, we will let you. And that's no credit to us at all. 
And the next year, our life just went pear-shaped. God just took all this stuff that was in our lives, said, you don't need this, you don't need that. You don't need to employ so many people, you, you can't afford to now anyway, so you've got to let them go. You've got to sell off all your equipment because you can't afford it, you don't need that. You've got to actually um, get rid of all your staff and you've got the house you've got in town which you use for your studio and your editing rooms, you lose that as well. Oh, your family home, that lovely place that you built that you love with a couple of acres and some peacocks and goats and sheep, you've got to get rid of that too. And we thought this was a big year of loss. It's not enough to buy another house, but you know what? A year later we realised it was a year of great gain. You know why? Because we were suddenly free. God couldn't move us while we had all this stuff cluttering. Now that's not the same for everybody. You might be in that boat with a business and... It's going well and God's using that, that's right. But for us and for what God had in mind for us, he had to move the furniture around. So that little word let is a big let. You have to be ready to do that. In reality, there's lots of things that get in the way, isn't there? But the big thing really is our sinful nature. Galatians 5 verse 17 says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. There's a battle going on between this thing called the sinful nature and the Spirit of God. They are complete opposite. What one wants is over here and likes is over here and what the other wants is like is over here. They are complete opposites, it says, and sometimes we're in the middle. And we know this battle is this battle is raging around us. And there's turmoil and there's conflict. But you know, if we let the Holy Spirit, he's gonna win every time. This sinful nature, what they call the sinful nature here, in some in some translations called flesh. And if you get that flesh, that word flesh, and then you flick it round inside out and knock off the first letter, you get self. What this is talking about is self. It's that, and it's not just flesh like we think flesh and bones, right? That's us. That's, where the, that's, that's what's guiding us? No. No, there's this, there's this inner man, which is our inner man, which is where the Spirit of God mingles and dwells and interacts with our spirit, right in the core of our being. And then there's this, what we call the outer man, which is the soul, which is where our mind is and our will is. and our, That's where we make our de- decisions and that's where the emotions are. And then there's this outermost person and this is this bit. And this bit is where you see what's happening inside. But the trouble is that circle in the middle, which is where our soul and our will and our decision is, that's where the battle is. And that can become like a hard shell. So with the Spirit of God mingling in the inner man can't get out through this shell and be seen in the outer man. Because it's there, there's decisions we've made. We've made decisions in the past that lock us in. There's been trauma that has affected emotions. They lock us in. We can't get out. I, I said once, I said lots of times, actually, as a young person, I'm never going to be a missionary. I never, ever, 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 ever will be a missionary. And God had to undo that decision before I could get past it. Until I undid it, there was this battle raging. We might say, um, when you hear someone say, look, come forward in church, you go, I made a decision years ago. That's not me. I don't go forward. All those other people can. I'm just going to sit in the back seat. You've got to undo that decision before the Holy Spirit can work through it because there's a battle there. You've had a relationship that's been really bad for you and, it's worth, and you've made a decision, I'm never going to go into that sort of relationship before and you're locked in and you're not free. And the Holy Spirit says, I want to break that shell so that what's happening in here can get out. Because otherwise what we see in the outer man is the, is the works of the flesh, not the fruit of the Spirit. Huge thing. You know those verses, verse 19 and 21, it says this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, that is when your sinful nature is guiding you and is leading you and is the measure that you use for everything, 
The results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. But, I love but, it's almost as big a word as the let, but, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. Where do you want to hang out? Do you want to hang out in this dirty, grubby factory that just produces, because the word for works there is, a, is the word for when stuff is produced by a factory. You imagine this stuff coming off the end of a conveyor belt. It's not attractive and not very useful. And it's probably dirty. You want that? Is that the works of the flesh? Is that, is that what you want being shown in your life? Because that's what happens unless the Holy Spirit is guiding you. Or do you want to hang out at Orchard Glory amongst the fruit? And just, it's a beautiful place. Isn't that a better place to be? I love that fruit. I love that fruit. It's actually, I like to see it as nine flavors of a, of a, a one fruit. Um, can we flick to that next slide? Thanks. Or is it up already? It's up. Yeah, thanks. This is, ah. Now, I could just you say, sorry, and I've made a mistake. Or I could pretend I was being smart. Um, has anyone noticed the mistake? Um, no, the thing that we deliberately did wrong on that slide today? Here's a clue. How many fruits are there? Nine. There's nine fruits. Which fruit is missing? Pardon? Uh, no, well, that's, they've changed it to strength of spirit, but there's one other. Pardon? I think I heard it. Love. Love. The divine love in its varied expressions. We left off to have a test. <clears throat> it's beautiful, isn't it? Divine love in its varied expressions. Joy that overflows. Peace that subdues. Patience that endures. Kindness in action. A full life of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit, or as Pastor Thomas said, self-control. And you know, it's, it's not stuff that we can make. I can't go, I'm going to make more joy today and I'm not going to make more love today. That comes from the, from the root of the vine. It comes from Jesus. He makes the fruit. It's just we're free for it to come out through us and, we get, and it all comes out at once. You know, you go to a hospital and you, and you visit someone and they know immediately that you have love for them because you're there and you're visiting. And they see joy when you come and cheer them up. They see peace when you calm them down. <laughs> and they see patience when you listen to them telling you all about their operation again. You see kindness in action because you've offered, just offered to go and look after their kids. You've seen goodness when you've brought a gift, a generosity bowl of fruit. They see, they see faithfulness because you say, I'm going to keep coming back and back and back. And they see meekness because you don't get cross when the nurse tells you to go. And they see self-control because you don't eat the fruit of the grapes. You leave them to them. You know? And this is what happens in our life. You, you see this fruit, not the works of the flesh when we're walking in freedom, when we're walking in the road and making sure we don't fall out fall off on one side or the other. You know, we've got a grapevine at home which spreads marvellously around the pergolas and all this sort of stuff. It looks great in summer. It's got lovely green leaves on it that gives us shade. And in autumn, it's just brilliant colours of golden leaves. And, and when it's fruiting season, there's not one fruit on it. Not one. Apparently, it's called an ornamental grapevine. Well, why doesn't it at least have ornamental grapes in, you know? But it does have nothing on it. It's fake. Sometimes we just worry about how we look, don't we? And we look good, but the fruit isn't real fruit. It doesn't exist because we can't make it work. However, oh, look, if I do this, this will make me look like I'm a loving person. It's not real love. If I do this, it's going to make, sure, make me look like I'm a joyful person. It's not real joy. It's the Holy Spirit fruit that is real fruit comes and... Unfortunately, that grapevine, um, I employ a resident 
a gardener in my home. Uh, she's sitting next to Lee over there. Um, and she tells me that there's a problem with the vine and it's withering and dying or something. Um, and she looked it up and there's apparently it's around the root there's weeds that are crowding it out or something. Is that right? Yeah, see? I know my garden. Um, and that's what happens to us. You know, there's weeds that come in our life and just, just try and cram out. Holy Spirit. Who wants freedom? Who chooses freedom? Who chooses freedom? Not many. Well, if you did choose freedom, you let the Holy Spirit come. I think the Holy Spirit is here today and he wants to come and he's saying, let me. Um, and it's about leaning hard. It's about leaning hard. You know, you can lean to the left or you can lean to the right or you can lean hard into the Holy Spirit. Um, some, you know the verse, what's it say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And I love that because you get this picture of somebody walking along the road and the wind's blowing and you tend to lean. You look for someone to lean on to support you. And sometimes you look to your own understanding and your own cleverness and your own resources. And God says, don't do that as you walk along the road. Lean hard, lean hard, lean hard. And if that word is, it means something for you today, I'm going to offer you a free gift. Not a set of steak knives, but um, a few years ago, I, um, I led a retreat in Hong Kong and I took the theme, lean hard, and I had some bookmarks um, designed and well, I designed them I think I got them printed for everybody and they were these pretty things lean hard and I was cleaning out I was looking in the drawer for something the other day and I found I had some left over yesterday so I thought well I might bring them along and if anybody wants a reminder at all you know this is for old people really who still use books so I, I should just explain what a bookmark is so a bookmark <laughs> Bookmark is something you can put in your last page and when you close it, you come back next morning, open it, boom, magic. Very clever. But if you want to take one of these today just to remind you that it's about leaning hard into God, pushing into him, into his spirit. The verse for that, for that uh, retreat was, Come unto me all that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. So... Come and see me and just grab one. I'd love to get rid of them. But that's it. That's the key for today, I think. That if you, if you want to stay on this walk of freedom, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Lean hard into the Holy Spirit and look for the fruit. At the end of the day, look for the fruit. Because, you know, there's either going to be the works of the flesh or there's going to be the fruit of the Spirit from the decisions you made that day. And let the Holy Spirit make those decisions. I wonder if the musicians can come because there's one more verse I just want to, last verse we just want to talk about a little bit today. It's the last thing. Some people say that with Paul's writings in his book, if you want to know what his, what his main point is, Read what he says at the beginning of the book and at the end. He bookends the books, and he does that in Galatians. The first chapter, you'll find he says the same thing, and, and the rest in the middle is just him filling it in. But it's not only in the book, it's in chapters and in sound little grabs. And in this one, he said the same thing at the beginning. Verse 16, he said that. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. And in this last verse, he says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Those who belong to Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross. Have you? Have I? When I dealt with that question, I thought, no, that's something that just is a growing thing for me. It's a lifetime journey for me. That God in His love and His mercy and His graciousness just reveals things that I haven't let go of yet. I haven't nailed to the cross. And when they're nailed to the cross, they're not going to come back, right? But it says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. Now, I'm, 
I haven't checked it, but I'm pretty sure the Greek word there for every is every. It means every part of our lives. Every decision we make. The decisions about our career, the decisions about buying a house, those big decisions, decisions about what we do with our money, decisions about relationships. What do you mean every decision, Jeff? What, like what movie I go to watch? Yeah, what movie you go to watch? What books you go to read? What television you watch? What I have for breakfast? No, that doesn't count as a moral decision. But every moral decision. I don't say it, Paul says it. A guy called David Porson, who is a teacher, and he told me, didn't tell me. Well, he did, because I heard him say it, but I mean, he, didn't, he was telling me and 500 other people. But <laughs> he said, you know, he was a minister and a, a, a guy in England, he, and he was in England, and England, you know how England's a bit um, orderly. I can say that. Now, this guy, he became a Christian, and he came to the pastor and he said, look, pastor, Every Sunday night, I go to the movies. doesn't matter what's on. And you do that if you're English and in England. Then you go to the theatres. Every Sunday night, nothing would budget. You go to the theatres. And he said, now that I'm a Christian, does that mean that I can't do that anymore? Now, I guess the pastor could have said, yes, there's a law in this church. You don't go to the movies anymore. But he said he didn't. He said, well, how about next time you go, take Jesus with you. See if he likes it. And this guy went to the movie theatre and he went to the window to buy his ticket like he always did. And he said, two, please. Shirley. Most of the people are called Shirley who sell tickets in the movie theatres, I think. Um, <laughs> said, yeah, I'll have two, please. He said, oh, you've got companion tonight. You've got someone coming with you. He said, yes, I'm taking Jesus with me. He looked a bit odd and thought, oh, well, you know, the sale is a sale, so she sold some two tickets. The next week he, he saw the pastor and the pastor said, you go to the movies? Yeah. Did you take Jesus with you? Yeah. How'd he go? Oh, actually, we left after five minutes. He wasn't enjoying it at all. You know, and that's the thing, isn't it? Like, does Jesus enjoy all this stuff we do? Is, a spirit, is that a spirit desire that is put in us? Or is it a fleshly desire? Every, every decision we make. I'd like, I want to invite you to say a prayer with me. But I, I'm a bit concerned sometimes when I say prayers that I don't know what's coming. If I'm just reading it off the screen, I'm not sure that I might suddenly find myself saying, I'm about to give Pastor Yat one everything in my bank account. Oh, I didn't realize that was coming. No, but so I'm, what I'm going to do is um, bring up this prayer. I'll read it and I'm going to pause occasionally. You can tell, you can tell when I've paused because I've stopped speaking. I'm going, to, I'm going to pause occasionally and invite you just to join me in saying, Jesus, that's my prayer. Or something similar. You might want to say something else. But for you to own that prayer then, having been said that, you say, and then we'll go on to the next section. Because it's about you and God transacting today. It's not about you doing what I'm asking you to do. It's about you and God coming to this place of transaction. And you speaking to him and saying, this is how I see my life. This is how I want my life to be. And will you... Will you come and invade my life and be part of that? Would you like to stand and we'll, we'll do that together? So I'll just read it. I'll pause and I'll say, Jesus, this is my prayer. And if you'd like to join me in saying, Jesus, this is my prayer and owning that. Holy Spirit, you know my heart. and You understand my deepest wants and needs and you know my every intention. You know me better than I know myself. There is nowhere I could run to escape your presence and nothing I could hide from you. And that's why right now, I'm asking you to give me your divine wisdom and guidance. Jesus, that's my prayer. Even though I may feel like I can't move forward or see what's ahead, you see me and you know me, so please guide me. As you guide me, restore me. I will place my hope in you at all times because you know all things and by you my life is held together. Jesus, that's my prayer. So hold me close, Lord, and teach me to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've given me. Direct my steps as you guard my life because I want to glorify you. In Jesus' name, that's my prayer. About a month ago, 
I was thinking about this message and this song came to my mind and wouldn't leave me alone and I got this sense that God wanted this, this song at the end of today's service and I just held that thought all through my preparation. This just kept coming back and kept thinking on. But, but this week I thought, you know what, I, I don't feel comfortable actually asking um, the worship leader for a particular song. They do a great job of just waiting on God every week and, and he gives them the playlist and I shouldn't really interfere. But maybe I'll just mention that, um, you know, this is what the message is about and this is where we're going and would you like to pick a song that fits? I got a message from May the next morning saying, um, would this one be appropriate? And guess what? (laughs) It was the same song. And it's not a song that I've sung here before. I didn't know whether you knew it or sang it. Um, And as... Pastor was speaking earlier today and in the pre prayer stuff, and we were singing about Holy Spirit coming. I, I really sense that God today is calling, calling us to surrender. It's calling us to let. It's calling us to let go of stuff. Some of us are call, it's specifically asking you to let go of things, to surrender them to Him. We love being independent. That's what the world is all about, isn't it? But God says, be dependent on me. Let me lead you. Let me provide for you. Let me guide you into freedom. Let me come and just invade your life. I want you you just to consider if your journey, if in your journey, I, I just believe that there's people here today who have made some sort of decision that is locking them in. That's all I just sense. And you would, if that's you, you would know that. But, but we'll say, let, let go. And as we sing this song, which is all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. If that's not you, don't sing it. You don't have to sing it just because it's plain. Because <laughs> God knows what's in your heart. And there's nothing special coming out the front. It's not more holy because the pastors tend to sit out the front. But, you know, especially today, there's this idea of walking in freedom. For you to just get out of your pew and walk down the front is saying with your outermost being, look, I want to walk following you, Jesus. I want to walk in the freedom you give me. I want to get out the front. And I know that every week I've said, that's not me, but I'm undoing that decision and I'm coming forward because I want to surrender. I want to, I want to make room for you. I want you to come and move the furniture in my life around. Not for my desire, for my my benefit, but because, Jesus, you've done everything for me and your grace is poured out on me. You've adopted me as your child. You've redeemed me. You've done everything else. I read a story of Abraham Lincoln the other day, which apparently is not quite true, but it's nearly true. But he went to some place where they were selling people in the slave market and he bought this young girl and he took her and he said, you're free to go. I bought you so you're free. And she said, well, in that case, I want to go with you. I want to stay with you. Someone that kind, that gracious, that generous. Jesus, you set me free. I want to stay with him. Thanks, mate. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him Before we sing the next stand song, I want you to just 
for you to reflect upon what has been shared. And as I read out to you the nine attributes or the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit, after I mention each one, will you just pause and say, Lord, I need more of this. Or perhaps you're saying, Lord, I'm really shortchanging myself because there's some of this fruit of the Spirit that's really missing in my life and I really need more of it. And so here is the list. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, when I look at this list, I know there are things that I need to grow in. There are things I need to improve in. So if you know that those are some areas that are in large measure, perhaps missing or things that you want to grow in, that there's something we can do about it. And then he says here, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. That means the one thing that can help us to put on more of the fruit of the Spirit is that when you crucify the desires of the flesh, the passion of the flesh. And then there's a word here that says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And I'm going to ask Joe to come on, and he has done this before. You know, the word keep in step is really this, that we are not, you know, let's say, Joe, I, I'm the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is not behind. Neither is the Holy Spirit in front of you. But the Holy Spirit is with you, side by side. And to keep in step with the Spirit means if I raise my, if the Holy Spirit raises his hand like this, that's right. If the Holy Spirit says this, if the Holy Spirit slaps you, <laughs> not that often, I think, but it means we keep in step with the Spirit. We are following what the Spirit is doing and we keep in step. And that's how you can put on the fruit of the Spirit. That's how you can grow in that walk with God. I want you to just imagine right now, as we sing this next stanza, all to Jesus, I surrender. Imagine the Holy Spirit just next to you right now, every single one of you. And then imagine the Holy Spirit takes a step forward. And the Holy Spirit is saying, let's walk down to the altar right now. Will you keep in step with the Spirit? Will you come before the Lord and say, Lord, there are some of these areas in my life that I need to put more of, put more in my life, the fruit of the Spirit. And I need to crucify the flesh. I need to crucify the passion of that flesh. And I want to keep in step with the Spirit. I'm going to ask us, you know, we have more than enough time. I want, to, I want these altars just to be open. I want you to just step up from where you are and keep in step with the Spirit. And you know the Spirit of God is saying, let's move that leg and, and move on in the front. Or, or let's come and put on more of the, of the fruit of the Spirit. Or perhaps you're here and, and there are doubts or fear or, or some, some uncertainty. You're, you're questioning things that you don't fully understand. And it's like the Holy Spirit will say, I will give you understanding. I will give you understanding. Will you not perceive it? Will you not understand? I'm going to give you understanding. Will you keep in step? with the Spirit. So let's just do that. Let's just, I'm going to ask you right now, Lord, I just want to thank you that even as we sing this song, that the Spirit of God will be moving up from where we are next to us and, and coming and, and to the front as, as if we are we are keeping in step with the Spirit and moving out and letting the Spirit of God do that work in our hearts, in our lives. Lord, we want to honor you. We want to worship you. We want to surrender all to you. Crucify the passion and the fleshly desires uh, that, Lord, to the cross and that Jesus, you will lead us and you will guide us. Will you just step up from your seat and come as we sing this song right now? Yeah. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at His feet I bow
Lord, we just want to thank you that every step of the way you are leading us and you're guiding us. And that you have called the church to keep in step with what the Spirit of God is doing. We sense the urgency of the hour. We sense, Lord, that you're doing something fresh and new. And Lord, you're bringing into each arena of our lives an alignment that says, walk with the Lord. That says, obey what God has for you. Lord, there are times we don't always understand. But Lord, we are believing for the breakthrough in understanding, in perception, in listening, in hearing your voice. And then coming into alignment with what you have. And so I pray for every one of us here today, in every arena of our lives, that Lord, you will attune us to hear, to listen, to walk, and to keep in step with the Spirit of God increase the capacity of our heart in the areas of the fruit of the spirit lord help us to to crucify that fleshly desires the sinful nature that lord we come into the understanding of your calling and your ways and your purpose in our lives the world needs a new purpose the world is looking for a spiritual purpose and lord we are the answers we can provide the answers lord we can fulfill that great commission you can you can bring us to a place lord that when we speak truth when we speak revelation people will look at us and say yes these are people that have been with jesus these are disciples of christ and so father i just want to thank you the empowering of the holy spirit that comes upon us lord indeed that encounter, the pouring out of your Spirit has not only begun, it has started over 2,000 years ago, and that now, Lord, we are carrying on that fire, we are carrying on that mantle, we are carrying on the desires and the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we are commissioned to fulfill all of those things. And Lord, we want this encounter in a deeper way. And even this Wednesday, as we come together as a church to pray, to press in, Lord, there are things that you're going to speak to us. There are things that you're going to reveal to us. There's things, Lord, in the, in the supernatural that you will show to us. Uh, and that, Lord, we are going to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we thank you for this. Uh, we give you praise. Uh, and now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with each one evermore. Amen and amen. God bless you. You know, there's such a a wonderful presence of the Lord that is here. Will you go in His power, in His strength? And uh, don't forget this Wednesday prayer meeting. Let's come together and let's press in. All right? Change your schedules and let's come together and believe God for the breakthroughs. Amen. Amen.